Oh, if God's so good, if God's so powerful, why is there evil? What a bad thing, why do all these bad things happen? Well, we are returning to the, the Gospel of John, and we are in John chapter 5. We're going to be looking specifically into verses 1 through 9. However, I am going to read uh, through verse 18 so that we need a little context to be able to properly uh, analyze the first nine verses. So John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, I've entitled this sermon, Do You Want to Be Healed? After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your, your precious word. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that we know that you are the son of God. You are the son of God who is co-eternal and co-equal with God. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, just ask that you would speak to and through me and open eyes, ears, hearts, and minds, Lord, that we would, we would rejoice in your word and understand how it is that we're to apply it in our own lives for your glory. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in chapter 5, we begin a transition, or John does in his gospel, a transition. And chapters 5 to 10 of the Gospel of John, they highlight the escalating conflict between Jesus and the Jewish religious leaders and their followers. John refers to these, these relig religious leaders and their followers who are opposed to Jesus. John refers to them as the Jews. So when you read the Jews, and John's saying the Jews, it's not all of the Jewish people. The Jews refers to the religious leaders and those that are with the religious leaders. Now, William Cook writes this. He says, a forensic motif is noticeable in these chapters. In virtually every chapter in this larger section, the Jews play the role of interrogator. So we're going to watch out for that. How the Jews are constantly interrogating Jesus. He goes on to say, they assess Jesus' testimony, weigh the evidence, and make a judgment. This interesting literary format places the reader in the thought-provoking position of being forced to evaluate the evidence. And this is something that I've alluded to in previous chapters, that this is an apologetic, right? John is making an argument. He's not apologizing. He's making an argument. He wants us to be able to think and to see and to weigh the evidence. And in fact, I haven't referenced these verses in a while, but remember the purpose of John's gospel. John chapter 20, starting in verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of John's gospel. So three primary points that 
Uh, I want you, if you take a note, you can write these down. Three primary points that this block of scripture, verses 1 and 9, uh, uh, emphasizes. First, the uselessness of unbiblical religion. The uselessness of unbiblical religion. Number two, man's inability to heal and save himself. Man's inability to heal and save himself. And number three, healing and wholeness and rest that is found in Jesus Christ alone. Healing, wholeness, and rest that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And I will reference each one of these topics as we move through the verses. So with those thoughts in mind, let us enter into our text, which is the Word of God. Verse 1 of chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So, I've never been to Jerusalem, but my understanding is, uh, it, anywhere, on all sides, if you're going to go to Jerusalem and you're walking, you're going up to Jerusalem. You walk up. Jerusalem is elevated. So, it's always, when you read, what does it mean going up to Jerusalem? It's, you need to, when you're walking, you're just, you're going up, right? And, and conversely, when you read about going down, that's typically going down to a lower land. So, that's... That's pretty simple to understand. This Feast of the Jews, what is this Feast of the Jews? Well, we're not sure. Uh, biblical the uh, theologians and historians uh, aren't sure. But here's what we do know. In 2 Chronicles uh, 8, verse 13, uh, the chronicler gives us three primary feasts. And it's probably one of these feasts that the, the Jews would regularly go to Jerusalem for to celebrate and to worship. So you've got the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Passover. You've got the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Booths. And if you don't know what the Feast of Weeks and Feast of Booths are, that's okay. Just know there's three primary feasts that the Jews would typically go up to Jerusalem uh, for. And so we're not sure which feast it is. But there was this feast, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. We know that. That's what John tells us. Verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roofed colonnades. So there's some significant bits of information that John gives us in this verse. If John is, we're looking at right now the uselessness of unbiblical religion. Okay, And John is setting the table to help us understand the uselessness of unbiblical religion. So some significant bits of information. First, a sheep gate. This sheep gate, in the ESV, it's capitalized. It's a gate by which literal sheep were led into Jerusalem. It's the sheep's entrance to the city of Jerusalem. It's the only time this Greek word is used in the entire New Testament. It's never, ever referenced again throughout the entire New Testament. It may be the same sheep gate that's described, however, in the Old Testament in Nehemiah chapter 3. And remember, Nehemiah... He goes back. Jerusalem's been destroyed and wiped out. And he goes back and begins to oversee the rebuilding of uh, Jerusalem. So why is this significant? Why, if this word and this gate is never referenced throughout the, all of the New Testament, and it may correspond to this one sheep gate that was built in Nehemiah, why, why does John even bring this up? Well, I think there's some, some significance. And so the biggest of which, it's real simple, well, who's the true sheep gate? Who, who's the true gate by which the sheep enter and will enter into not only Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom, but the new Jerusalem? The, the true sheep gate is Jesus Christ himself. I think John is establishing this subtly as he lays out his argument. Yet in the millennial reign, Jesus will be the fulfiller of Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 13. You heard Pastor Rob read it just a little while ago. In the land of Benjamin, the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah, flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one, of the one who counts them, says the Lord. Very interesting. We, we understand because we've been given the full revelation uh, of God, I would suggest to you who, that one, I don't have to suggest it to you, I just ask you the question, who do you think that one is? That one is Jesus Christ. The other thing he tells us is, uh, that's interesting, that this, there's a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda. 
Now, you, you might know there's a Bethesda in Maryland. There's probably other Bethesdas, lots of interesting, always interesting to find out these biblical names uh, throughout our, our country, but not that Bethesda. Bethesda actually means house of mercy. House of mercy. So think about that in the, in the scope of this presentation by John. So I think he's laying out an even further eternal symbolism by bringing this to our recognition. The sheep will be led into the new Jerusalem, entering through the narrow gate. And instead of being slaughtered for their sins, which is what the sheep gate here in John is for the sheep to come into Jerusalem. Why? Why, did, why would they bring sheep into Jerusalem, into the temple? Well, those sheep were going to be what? Sacrificed. Sacrificed for sins. But the sheep in the new Jerusalem, they'll enter through the narrow gate, and instead of being slaughtered for their sins, they'll be completely washed of their sins by the blood of the Lamb, because His house is a house of mercy. Now, we're able to glean this because we have this full revelation. John, who wrote this gospel, also wrote the final book of the Bible. And so he, I think, is setting, he's helping us to glean this information by kind of setting the table for what is about to take place. And then five colonnades. So a colonnade is a covered, protected porch. Okay, uh, just imagine if you have a deck and it's got walls on two sides to the back and a roof. Okay, and the front would be open. And they're open so that people could get in and out. There's a, a way for people to be protected during the rain or the blistering heat or the, maybe the, some of the, the sandstorms that they had there. And uh, it was especially necessary for those that couldn't get very far very fast. And so there's five of these things here. And once again, remember, we're in Jerusalem. We're at the temple. So people are coming to worship. And there's these pools. And so these pools, at a minimum, these pools were necessary for people as they would come. Um, th that people would need to cool off. People would need to wash. Um, I just read a news report that um, the annual trip, in the annual trip to Mecca, that there were over a thousand, this is just a few weeks ago, at least over a thousand Muslim pilgrims who traveled to Mecca, they died because of heat, because they were trampled. Um, it, it was, in these, when these feasts took place, there were thousands and thousands of people that would converge upon Jerusalem. So these pools were, were necessary for physical relief. Verse 3. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Verse 4. Hmm. Verse 4. My Bible doesn't have a verse 4. Why is there no verse 4? Well, in some, in, in some of your Bibles, they may actually have a verse 4. It may be bracketed. It should be bracketed. And it may read something like this. Waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever sickness with which he was afflicted. So, what? Well, why is there, in the ESV, there's no verse 4. Why, maybe in other translations, is verse 4 bracketed? Because it's not in the oldest manuscripts. Now, one thing you have to remember. We have none of the originals uh, of anything in the New Testament. We have no original. We don't have the original Gospel of John. What we do have are hundreds of copies. Because how did they, when John wrote his Gospel, and he dispensed it to other churches, they would copy it by hand. And so there are lots and lots of copies all over the place. And these copies are uncovered. 
And so what, what is amazing about this is that, so if there was a copy that went to Cherokee County and a copy that went to Cobb County and a copy that went to Pickens County and a copy that went to, to Dawson County and Hall County, as they're uncovered, the historians are looking and they're like, okay, it was John from, you know, I'm, maybe I shouldn't use John, Bill from Cherokee County and Don from Cobb County and whoever, all these, all these different men copied and they're exactly the same, almost exactly the same. But then there were some that were found, of these copies that were found, that there were this addition. And so it's believed that there, whoever was copying, the scribe at the time, whoever made this first original edition, was doing so to try to add some context. But John himself did not write this. That is pretty, we're pretty well assured. But uh, we are given it at least an idea of what it might have said, but it's not from John's hand. And that context, even by the scribe, although it's not the word of God, it's helpful in, in us understanding. So uh, it's excluded, but it is instructive as to why the lame gathered here and how it was viewed by the public. Because what they believed was that in these pools there was a moving of the water and that somehow it was an angel who came down and stirred the water and that only the first person who could get himself into the water would be healed. So really it's an odd thing. It's an odd belief. These multitudes, remember, are gathering for the particular feast. And they were, they came, or some of them had to be brought, in anticipation of a miracle happening as the crowds gathered to worship, because that's when God was going to show up at these feasts. If God was going to show up, it was going to be at these feasts. And so they gathered and they came and they hoped in this idol that is the pool. And at least at worst, they knew they would receive some sort of alms, which they would sustain themselves for at least a few days. They would beg for food, money, whatever it is, of thousands of people coming in. So we, we understand a little bit about the motivation. But this pool had become an idol. It had become an idol. There was no, there, there was nothing special about this pool. This pool had no healing powers. But they believed it. They wanted it to be true. You know, Isaiah chapter 22 verse 11. So in the context of Isaiah chapter 22, it's, he's talking about the day of trouble. And verse 11 says, You made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But you did not look to him who did it or see him who planned it long ago. Meaning, man... Men of Israel, you made this pool, but you didn't look to God. You, 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 you don't look to God. You, you're looking to the created thing, not the creator. And so what should these multitudes have been doing? What should everybody have been doing as they were converging on Jerusalem? Well, what they should have been doing is rejoicing in the Lord. Micah chapter 7, verse 7 but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Verse 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. What should these multitudes have been doing? They should have been looking to God, praising God, repenting, waiting, worshiping. Worshipping the true God, the God of the Bible, not the idol of this pool. I also want you to realize, look at the, the impotence of Judaism at the time. There is nobody, there is no priest, there is no Pharisee, there is no Sadducee, there is no high and religious leader who can do anything for these poor people or is interested in doing anything for these poor people. And so we see in these opening verses the uselessness of unbiblical religion. Now, the Old Testament commanded and directed the Jewish people how they were to worship God. 
I'll say that again. The Old Testament commanded and directed the Jewish people how they were to worship God. Just as the New Testament instructs us and directs us how we are to worship God. Not just how we are to assemble ourselves, but the heart with which we are to assemble ourselves. Trusting God, upholding God's word, seeking to understand who and how it is we are to worship. However, Judaism had become a dead religion because the God of the scriptures had been removed as the central focus and hope for Israel's salvation. So they had no hope of God's promises being fulfilled because Judaism had become man-centric as opposed to Theo, God, God-centric. And so the hope is in what man can do. If, if somehow I can just stumble or get thrown into this pool, uh, then I'll magically and mysteriously be healed physically, and then I can live the life that I, I see everybody else living that I want to live. And so then we, I think John helps us to understand that the next point, man's inability to heal and to save himself. Man's inability to heal and to save himself. So why is it that we as human beings have such difficulty in coming to grips with the reason for all that is wrong with the world? Why do we have such difficulty coming to grips with the reason for all that is wrong with the world? Why are there evil and evil consequences in the world. Because human beings in their natural state are sinners who do evil. Contrary to popular false belief, human beings are not naturally good. The Bible cannot speak more clearly and enough about that. We are not naturally good good compared to God. We are not holy. We are not the people that we have been designed and called to be because of our sin nature. But we are naturally evil. Only Jesus Christ is naturally good. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Were you making a practice of sinning before you came to Christ? Then guess what? Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And all praise be to Jesus Christ that we are able to be transformed. Touch briefly here, because Jesus himself touches briefly here on sin and its impact on our physical lives. Sin and its impact on our physical lives. Now, all that is wrong with the world includes the brokenness of our physical bodies. And the Bible makes clear that the physical sickness, deformities, genetic defects and diseases that humans experience, why do they occur? What are they rooted in? They're rooted in sin. They are either the result of our direct sin or the indirect results of living in a sin-filled evil world. So, my body breaking down, part of that I've contributed to. I'm directly I've been directly involved in that. But part of that is living in an evil, sin-filled world. And we look and say, well, yeah, that's kind of like this uncontrollable thing. No, no, it is. It's very controllable. And we need to understand this. My sin, my sin, it not just, it doesn't only impact me. But right? How many times have I throw that pebble in the, in the pond, the still pond, and those ripples go out? My sin 
impact, has an impact. What does Jesus say to the man in verse 14 here of chapter 5? Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more. Sin no more. He, he was, he, it, we, it can't be any more clear, his sin had contributed to him being in the condition he was for 38 years. It wasn't all on him, but his sin definitely contributed to that. Mark chapter 2, verse 5. You remember this when preached through the Gospel of Mark, the, the paralytic, the man who's lifted down, they get up on the roof with this guy, right? They rip open the roof and they drop the guy in. Mark chapter 2, verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Revelation chapter 2. And I have plenty of other places I could go to, but I'm just going to leave it here. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse, uh, pick it up in verse 20. So this is a letter to the church in Thyatira from the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the letters to the seven churches. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. We're so blinded by our sin, deceived by our sin, and in love with our sin, that we fail to grasp the absolute nefarious effects it has on us physically and on others as well. Now God, who is God and is sovereign over all things, in His grace and mercy afflicts us because of our sin against us, against Him. He afflicts us he doesn't, he could judge us. And first, we, there are some examples in the Bible where he does. He, his mercy comes to an end and he judges people. But he afflicts us because of our sin against him. And he does it for our good and for his glory. Nobody understood this better than David. David, in Psalm 51, he recalled his unrighteousness before God. Psalm 51, verse 3, he says, For I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. He realized that his suffering was directly related to his sin. In Psalm 38, pick it up in verse 3. Listen to this. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. And then verse 17 of Psalm 38. For I am ready to fall and my pain is ever before me. And yet David knew all he could do was throw himself upon the mercy of God and that God would listen. That God would listen for the glory of his great name. Staying in verse uh, Psalm 38, looking at verses 21 and 22. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. And in Psalm 26, verse 3, he says, For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. Listen, sin brings consequences, yet our sin also brings loving correction and a gracious path by which we can return to God and serve God and glorify God. Now, why are people, little children, babies, why are babies born with birth defects?
we'll get there in a few weeks. But John chapter 9, starting at verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. So, blind from birth, that means this baby was born blind. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Listen, I have no idea, specifically, but I do know this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. And this, this verse helps us to understand that God knew. This, this man who was a baby and was born blind, God allowed that to happen. When he was born blind, no one understood why. It had to be a horrible experience for his parents. And as the child grew and all the things they had to help the child with and deal with, But when this moment in John 9 came, several decades later, the goodness of God was revealed. Because this man, his blindness, it wasn't about him. It was about God. Because this man, his life, it wasn't about him. His life was about God. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, Moses pleading before the Lord God... And he says in verse 10, he says, But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Uh, Moses had some form of speech impediment, some sort of problem. Listen to how the Lord answers. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Well, what's he saying to Moses? I know. I created you. Those who we might call special needs or disabled or deformed, they're created by God this way for his special purposes. What the enemy, in both of these cases, intended for evil, God allowed for good. And that is very hard uh, as we live it to comprehend it, especially if you're directly involved in, in the suffering that these things bring. How should we view injuries from accidents, assaults, and failures to pay attention to warnings and the consequences of living in a dangerous world? You know, I think one of the things that we fail to remember is that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. I do not deserve to be here right now. What I deserve is judgment and hell. That's what I deserve because of my sin. But I am so grateful to the Lord that I stand here, not only alive physically, but alive spiritually, and I am grateful for the physical suffering that I have endured, am enduring, will continue to endure. I'll take that any day of the week over what I do deserve. You know, what we receive, even in our physical injuries and sufferings, is mercy. A great example of this is Joni Erickson Tata. If you do not know her, it just Joni Tata, T-A-D-A. -A. Go to YouTube, Joni and Friends, listen to her testimony. Uh, here's, she was a young woman, came to Christ at, at around the age 14, went to uh, some Christian camp with a, her sister when she was around 18, 19, or 20, out swimming in a lake, Jumped off a dock, thought everything was she thought everything was fine. Jumped off head first to dive, hit a sandbar, broke her neck. Was actually laying at the bottom of the lake. Her sister was not paying attention to her. Her sister was actually already in the water on the other side of the dock. Got bitten by a crab. Her sister had no idea. She's laying there now, completely paralyzed. 
in about three feet of water. Her sister gets bitten by a crab. She turns to yell to Joni, hey, watch out for the, these crabs. And she can't find her. She gets up on the dock. She looks. She sees her sister there dying. She jumps in, saves her. Well, she's 60-ish. She's been a quadriplegic ever since. And But here's what she's done. She has sought to, in her paralyzation, she has sought to glorify and honor the Lord. She knows she knows two things. She knows that God allowed this for his glory, for his purposes. And she knows that she will understand that on the other side of eternity. And here's the best thing she knows is that as soon as she vacates that very broken physical body, she knows that someday she is going to have a perfect body. And she is going to know what it means to, to live fully as a human was designed to live. Psalm 118, 18. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Oh, thank you, Lord. Revelation 3, 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. And as Paul, in many of his letters, reminds us often, God's glory is revealed in physical weakness. So now we think about sin and its impact on our spirits. You know, sin doesn't just impact us physically, it impacts us spiritually. Blindness. We see with our physical eyes. I see the things of the world. I see the physical. But because of our sin, before we come to Christ, we're all spiritually blind. And that's the point of John chapter 9. In, in Matthew chapter 6, the Gospel of Matthew, listen to these words. The eye, verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. The only way your eye is going to be healthy is if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have been saved. So you can see the things above. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. You think, you think you're walking the right way. You think you know. You, you think you've got it figured out. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? The lameness, right? Look at these, these multitude of invalids. They were blind, they were lame. Lameness, you know, we all may be able to walk. But because of our sin, we're unable to walk with God. We cannot keep in step with the Spirit unless we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's impossible. Now, paralyzed, our whole body may function with great effectiveness, but because of our sin, unless you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're unable to keep the moral law. You can't uphold it. You can't do it. You're paralyzed. And the primary difference between this man we find in John chapter 5 and the man born blind in chapter 9, this man was healed physically. But based on this retelling by John, it certainly appears that this man died in his sins. Right here in John chapter 5. Whereas the man born blind was clearly healed both physically and spiritually. And without spiritual healing that comes through repentance and faith in Christ, all physical healing is temporary and of little use. For those who are physically well today will someday no longer be that way. Verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. You know, there's a multitude of invalids, yet Jesus focuses on one man. Why? You know, there's instances of Scripture where Jesus healed everybody who came to him. Matthew chapter 15, verse 30. And great crowds came to him bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured and all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him 
and healed them all. However, when Jesus, and it's not just Jesus, Jesus has the entourage of the disciples, not just the twelve. When Jesus shows up and with his disciples at the sheep gate, none of these people, none of them recognize his voice or know who he is. Their hope and belief is tied up in the superstition of this pool. A.W. Pink writes, The great physician approaches this crowd of sufferers who are not only sick but helpless. But there was no more stir among them than in the quiet waters of the pool. He was neither wanted nor recognized. How foolish. Yet today we see similar forms of idolatry. A man's nature is to turn to special techniques and sacred objects and mystics and formulaic recitations of prayers, these prayer formulas, spiritual advisors, healing cloths, anointing oils. All of these are idolatrous perversions of true religion. Richard Phillips, he writes this, Biblical Christianity is not a religion of mystical power, but of divine grace received through simple faith. Why does John highlight this event and Jesus is focusing on this one man? I think in part, at least, it's for our personal application and accountability. Listen, you have been given stewardship over the life and the body that God has given you. You will be held accountable for the life that you live and have lived. You will be. And you'll be held accountable for who you have sought to live for and who you have sought to glorify while you're here on earth. Instead of praising Jesus and giving thanks to God and proclaiming Jesus as the one who freed him from the bondage of sin and suffering, instead of proclaiming those things to the Jews once Jesus heals him, what does this man do? He spurns the grace and mercy of God by ratting out Jesus to the religious leaders who were seeking to kill him, and this man knew it. This man was enlightened to the truth. He tasted the grace of God and he turned from it. I think this is what the author of Hebrews is alluding to in Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. To restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Uh, the focus on this man, out of many, one out of many, is a warning to each of us. The God of our universe is a massive God, and he is also a personal God. And we will personally give account to this massive God. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? As we move through the Gospel of John, I tried to, I've tried to highlight several times heart questions that Jesus asked people. This is one of those. This is a heart question. Do you want to be healed? From a human perspective, it seems like a ridiculous question. This man has been an invalid for 38 years. Of course he wants to be healed. Who wouldn't want to be healed? Who wouldn't want to be able to get up and to walk? But Jesus isn't asking this question to draw his attention to his physical problem. He's asking this question to get the man to focus on the root cause of his lameness. lameness. He's not focusing on what the man wants, 
but what the man needs and why the man is in this condition. That's the thrust of this question. And how does the man respond? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. He, man, he just, this guy just draws out those six shooters and he starts pointing fingers. The problem's not with me. It's not with, he's saying, hey, it's not with, it's not with, not with me. The, the problem's actually with God. And how God is preventing me from being healed. See, he's lame. He can't move. But God allowed this. He, he has no one to help him get into the water. And God hasn't provided. Now, the water only heals one person at a time and then very infrequently. Where is the God of power and mercy and compassion? So yeah, I want to be healed, but it certainly seems like God's against me. Do we not hear this? The same accusations cast against God today? Oh, if God's so good, if God's so powerful, why is there evil? What a bad thing. Why do all these bad things happen? Have we never considered what I just talked about in terms of what we actually deserve and how God is gracious and merciful in his chastisement of us? You know, no, there, there's no acknowledgement by this man of his sin or repentance from it. N none. Verse 8. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. So Jesus heals him anyway. But only physically. He doesn't change the desires of the man's heart. Why not? Well, God never forces himself upon anyone. But I think he doesn't change the man's heart to prove the issue is not with God, but with man. Even if a man stands face to face with the living Christ and is given perfect physical condition, man is totally unable comprehend. So here we turn to healing, wholeness, and rest that is found in Jesus Christ alone. Notice this about the man. He has no faith in Jesus. He does not believe in Jesus. He does not love Jesus. He, he has done absolutely nothing deserving of being healed, and yet Jesus mercifully heals him anyway. And note how Jesus heals him. He just speaks. The Father speaks through the Son by the Spirit, and the man is healed. Jesus doesn't touch him. Jesus doesn't anoint him. Jesus doesn't pray over him. The man doesn't plead. He doesn't pray. He doesn't reach out to Jesus. And what happens? Verse 9, And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Immediately. The man, Jesus says, get up, take your bed, walk. Boom. While he's speaking it. For 38 years, let's not overlook this. 38 years, this man had been like this. What do you think his muscles were like? Completely atrophied. What do you think his tendons and joints were like? Completely dried out. What do you think his central nervous system was like? A complete disaster. This man had been imprisoned in this broken body for 38 years. And just like that, he's made whole. How would you have responded? I know how I would have responded. I would have done exactly what this guy did. 
Because, man, look at all this stuff I'm going to be able to get now and do. How should, when we come to understand who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us, how, how, I'll tell you how I responded to that, that healing. I was ecstatic. I would have hugged and kissed Jesus. I would have worshipped him. I would have pleaded with him to come and heal others who, who were suffering next to me. But how does this man respond? He walks away. He walks away from Jesus. Doesn't say a word. More on this next week. Last point. Listen, we need to be able to see this. That this healing of this man on this day, in this way, was all part of God's plan of Jesus going to the cross. John makes clear that this was the seminal event that triggered the Jews into putting together a calculated plan to kill Jesus. And there are two phrases in verses 8 and 9 which help us to see this truth. What day was it? The Sabbath. What should be taking place on the Sabbath? What should people be doing on the Sabbath? Nothing. Don't carry anything. Don't eat anything. Don't, if your mule falls into a pit, don't try to save him. Don't pour oil because then you might, I mean, there were countless pharisaical rules. Don't do anything. And yet, when Jesus heals this man, what does he say to him? He doesn't say, get up and walk. He says, get up. Take your bed and walk. Why in the world would he do that? Why would he say that to him? Jesus wanted this man to be seen because he knew how the Jews were going to come after him and that this man would then turn on him. Jesus wants this man to be seen by the Jews, to be confronted by the Jews, so that they in turn will confront him. The purpose of this miracle was to confirm that Jesus was, in fact, God's Son and Christ. And thus, his message was one of grace. But all these people are missing it. God's desire was that this man would turn wholeheartedly to Christ and be completely healed, physically and spiritually. The true healing and wholeness only comes through Jesus Christ. Yes, we may be suffering in these physical bodies, but thanks be to Jesus Christ that we will be relieved and healed. And someday we're going to know. We're going to put on these new bodies. And it's going to be. Whoa. And it's going to be like that forever. We're not going to deal. With, with kidney stones. Or birth defects. Or compressed vertebrae. Or anything having to do with. Our brains. Being injured. Or whatever other illnesses and, and hurts and things that we're suffering from today. True healing and wholeness only comes through Jesus Christ. And true rest only comes through Jesus Christ. Because he is the one who fulfills the fourth commandment. Keep the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest the only way that we would have the ability to rest and worship God perfectly from the heart is in and through Jesus Christ he is our Sabbath rest Lord willing we'll pick up the rest of the story next Lord's Day let's pray 
Father God, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Uh, we thank you that you are God of grace and mercy and forgiveness and that you, you broke your body and allowed your body to be broken on the cross so that our broken bodies could be healed. You gave up your perfect body to be broken on our behalf so that our brokenness would be turned into healing. Holy Spirit, help us to remember these truths. Help us to live out, each of us who may be suffering in a variety of ways, not just because of the consequences of our own sin, which Lord, you know, I'm still, I suffer from the consequences of my 39 plus years of sin against you. But Lord, the being sinful in nature and the, the consequences of other people's sinful actions. Holy Spirit, help us to remember what Christ has done. Help us to be people that, that proclaim your goodness, even in the midst of suffering. Help us to be a people that, that look to those who are hurting and suffering and struggling. Lord, give us opportunities to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And God, as we, we get forth, uh, we go forth and get set to, to break bread together. Father, I just ask that you would bless the food, make it a blessing to our bodies. And Lord, as we enter into discussion, uh, Lord, I, I pray that above all else, you'll be glorified. That Holy Spirit, that you will rule, rule and reign in uh, our hearts, our minds, our tongues. And Lord, that you would, in and through uh, this discussion, you would continue to draw us together, draw us near, unify us for the mission that you have established this church for. We love and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.